Our final speaker today is Tom Dixon, who's going to talk on other practical considerations. I've known Tom for a long time, uh, extremely innovative scientist. Um, Truman Brown talked about chemical shifts uh, many years ago. Um, Tom uh, showed us how to essentially simultaneously use the chemical shift to image uh, in separate images fat and water. It's known as the Dixon sequence. And for his many contributions um, this year, he was honored by the International Society of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine with its highest award, the Gold Medal Award. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about practical considerations, Tom. Okay. Well, this is good for CME credit, so I guess I have to have some formal le learning goals here. I wasn't really sure whether I was talking about resolution or relaxation, so I've pushed that to the back if there's time. Uh, those are the rest of the topics. And start with uh, some comments on... Uh, okay. Oh, there's a pointer somewhere. Ah. Thank you. Attack this with two hands here. Uh, all right. Uh, I missed the first slider. Okay. Here is a spectrum of polycarbonate, carbon spectrum. This is the, the molecule, and it's a natural abundance carbon source. So uh, each one of these lines or clusters of lines is a single carbon resonance. And the question is, uh, what happens with uh, field strength here? And let's look at these little guys here. This is obviously a pair of lines. There must be some sort of difference in environment that the things have. If we doubled the magnetic field, what would happen here? Well, this is in parts per million. So in Hertz, these things would get twice as far apart and we might be able to resolve them completely. On the other hand, if we had, oh, hi. If we had uh, uh, only half the field, well, we might not realize there were two lines here. And in, the, in the, what I described is what happens if you have inhomogeneous uh, uh, results here. They, uh, the line splits. In the homogeneous case, where you have the environment moving back and forth over the same spins, or the spins moving from one environment to the other, the lines would get twice as wide if we doubled the field, so we would have not much we could do about that, except that we could see how long it takes the averaging process. Uh, okay, so that's one of the big three reasons that you want to go to higher field is to improve uh, resolution. You conceivably could resolve twice as many lines if you had twice the field. Okay, another advantage is uh, high field is uh, sensitivity. Uh, if you double the field, you will get four times the signal. And the reason for that is illustrated here. The electromotive force, or the signal that you get, is proportional to the amount of flux that goes through your coil, divided by the time it takes from precession to uh, change sign or change its direction. Um, this guy. And you might ask, we, we had this before, but you might have not got here yet, uh, how far can this go on? Eventually we're going to line up all the nuclei and we can't get any more magnetization out of the system than that. But we're nowhere near close. And uh, notice that I've chosen to give this Boltzmann factor with... Uh, with no magnetic units. It's the, the frequency here. The, the Tesla and amps and meters are your friend if you're designing magnets, but if you're using them, you're probably interested in what happens in your sample, and, that, and that's a, a frequency unit here. At any rate, the answer is the same, that for a 64 megahertz sort of a standard system here, at running at room temperature or body temperature, you have a factor of 100,000 that you could gain somehow or another. Uh, but um, we have more to it than just what the signal is. This is true, the signal goes up uh, fourfold, but there's noise present in any resistor, uh, called Johnson noise, in any resistor setup. And that, uh, you know, it's, it's a longer expression than this, 
but the the noise depends on the resistance, and that's the the resistance is the only thing up here that varies with the magnetic field. No, there we go. Okay, so if we double the field, we decrease the skin depth in the uh, copper uh, receiver coil uh, by square root of two. Oops. And that increases the resistance, since there's a, a thinner cross-section that you're going through, by square root of two. And the noise increases by the square root of that, or the fourth root of two. There we go. Uh, so the signal-to-noise ratio, instead of going up by four, goes up by uh, three and a third. Or if you like to look at that at how much faster can you get the job done if you're signal averaging, that's a factor of 11. Well, this is a biological group, so there's another source of loss that's usually going to be more important. And that is, uh, let's, let's just re revisit the last calculations. Um, now, we double B0, that's going to double the EMF that's actually within the mouse here, or within the subject. And if we double the electromotive force driving eddy currents, the eddy currents themselves will double. And that means, that since voltage or power is voltage times current, that we get four times the power if we keep the same current in the, uh, if we double B0 to keep the current the same in the RF coil. Uh, and that increases the coil resistance by four, since if you put one amp through it, the power is just uh, uh, the voltage. And so the noise goes up by a factor of two, and that means the signal to noise ratio went up uh, only twofold for looking at conductive biological samples. Or if you, again, are looking at the averaging time, you got a fourfold improvement in that. Okay, well, um, I hope the people in the back row can hear me here. I'm Yes? Okay, that, that's good, because I've got my neck turned around facing the other direction to see what I've written. Uh, okay, doubling B0 is, is a caveat here. will decrease T2 star conceivably by as much as uh, twofold, and if you double the bandwidth to try to get yourself back to the same position, uh, in that case, you, you cut the signal-to-noise ratio benefit to only square root of two from doubling the field. Uh, okay, more caveats. Um, the, this sensitivity is involved here, but doubling B0 increases the T1, or the time it takes before you can uh, repeat a measurement. And uh, Seymour Koenig and Rod Brown long ago made lots of tables like this where they have different types of tissues uh, and measure their relaxation rate, rate, which is one over the T1, versus frequency. Now, if you look here out in the range where we generally operate, the fat uh, it has the fastest relaxation and therefore is typically the brightest thing in the image. And since it's the brightest thing in the image, it causes uh, more artifacts than other things do. And it'd be fine, well, the fat's the brightest thing in the field, makes the most artifacts. And if we jack the field up, this ratio of the fat signal to the other signals goes up. So the effect of the uh, motional artifacts is going to be generally worse at higher field. Uh, now, there are some exotic ways to polarize nuclei that don't depend on B0. Um, we uh, see Truman, I think, discussed some of these. There's the simplest one to understand is it, it, you have a separate magnet for polarizing than you do for observing. Um, there's this Pasadena effect that has to do with ortho and para hydrogen and, and the fact that uh, hydrogen has the, the, well, 
it's a, it's a way to get uh, eliminate the Boltzmann factor here and get much higher polarizations. Uh, microwaves, I think, have already been mentioned. The electron has about a thousand times the uh, magnetic moment of a proton. If you can couple the electrons to the protons in a, in a creative way, you get rid of the uh, Boltzmann need. And here's a, an example of one of those uh, uh, new, uh, helium or xenon. This one happens to be a helium image of uh, mouse lungs from uh, Duke University. Um, now, what these four things have in common is that they're not relying on the Boltzmann effect to uh, generate the polarization. So let's revisit this. The EMF depends on flux, which doesn't change, and it also depends on the uh, uh, time to reverse, and that still goes down by a factor of two. So we double the main field in this case, in these four cases, you double the signal and you double the noise, and the whole thing is a wash. Well, sort of. But if you double the main field, you're, well, in the case of these uh, gases, I think you're almost certain to reduce the T2 star. And that invites uh, changes in bandwidth that actually raise the noise up to square root of two times. So the signal to noise ratio may get worse by a factor of square root of two. Here's a case where we expect the low field to outperform the high field. Uh, but you can only go so far because the copper losses will keep you from going to zero field, for example. And uh, um, you also probably want to make proton images with the same apparatus, and you need a field to be able to see those. So uh, we can only go so low. Well, the, the third main advantage of a higher field magnet is the prestige that it gives you. That's still fully functional. I'm not going to argue with that. And I just kicked in another one here that if it's not good enough to have the highest field, superconducting receiving coils or cold copper receiving coils uh, are a, a way that uh, another way to gain prestige. And they may be very useful at high fields and small samples. You, basically, they, they're useful where you're lost is from the copper rather than uh, from eddy currents within the subject. OK, on, on my assignment list, I was supposed to talk about susceptibility too. It interferes with or contributes to almost everything we do. And I'll have you know, a different take on some of these. We've already heard some. Uh, it does some good things and some not so good things. Um, here's one of the most important good ones. Uh, this uh, Ogawa uh, discovered, I guess, rather than invented, uh, uh, functional brain imaging. And just by, I assume this is a, I think this is a mouse. And depending on what he's thinking about, uh, the signal from the brain, from part of the brain, uh, can vary by plus or minus uh, one part in 14. That's become a whole industry. Here, uh, Mark Hakey's group has used susceptibility creatively. And the, the, the field gradients are high around brain veins. And he's set this up to accentuate the veins in the brain. Uh, here, the most recent uh, ISMRM gold medal uh, goes to Ch went to Chen Ho. And his group has been able to detect single mammalian cells. And these are T cells. They're not uh, ostrich eggs or single cells like that. Uh, and we made an attempt at uh, looking at lots of, uh, of uh, susceptible contrast agent, iron oxide. Uh, this is a, a rat leg that's been injected with uh, three micrograms of iron oxide. And you can see that where the iron oxide is here, um, but you can't make any measurements there. You know, there's dark and there's darker than dark. What, what are you going to do to quantitate this? And we looked at uh, fitting the phase in the regime in the region outside 
the area uh, where you could get good signals. And we got, instead of three, we got 2.9 micrograms. And in these control regions, uh, we got slightly negative numbers that are much smaller than three micrograms. So this looks good. Well, that's, that's about all I had that I could say that was good about uh, susceptibility for our business. Uh, this, this came up in the earlier talks too. Um, with heavier elements like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and especially uh, xenon, it's very sensitive. The chemical shift difference between two different compounds is generally large compared to the susceptibility of tissue. So you can do um, selective excitation of what you want or selective suppression and that works fine. If you want to do that for protons with water and fat, that doesn't work. I mean there are claims to the contrary, but there's a, a, a cottage industry that's been going on for decades now the, the, the problem is that, is that the air and the water have the susceptibility difference that's about the same as the chemical shift difference. Uh, so people have used phase creatively, and this is, uh, you know, decades after imaging started, after proton imaging started, and they're comparing two exotic methods here. And if you look where the arrows are, you can see that this is supposed to be water, this is supposed to be fat, and they, they get it wrong in a couple of spots there. Uh, so that's, and, and here's a, a worse example that shows what happens, uh, the, the ugly. Um, you, these are titanium dots that are used in some sort of orthopedic uh, application. And you can see that there's gross distortion near these titanium things uh, with the standard one and a half Tesla imager. This is the the, the uh, method where you use low a low field magnet for imaging, and instead of this 64 megahertz, this is two megahertz, and the distortions aren't so bad. Uh, over here is uh, no titanium. Well, there's titanium in somebody's wrist. And what do we have here? Let's see, this is a, two different different views of the wrist. And with one and a half Tesla, you not only get so much distortion, there, there's no possibility of backing out of this because the signal is just gone. But at the low field end here with a separate polarization mechanism, you can see what's going on. But I don't know why they don't just use x-rays. <laughs> Okay, um, I was assigned to talk on facilities, and I don't know much about facilities, so I thought I'd ask a riddle here. Uh, how many spectroscopists does it take to watch a worker replace an incandescent tungsten bulb over a magnet? Well, the answer is that LEDs outlast whole MRI facilities, so we're not going to have to watch that anymore. And facility construction has been getting easier as time goes on. I, I, some of us remember when you had to keep the cathode ray tube when it was color outside the three gauss line, not even the five gauss line. Well, liquid crystals aren't affected by this. It's, uh, it's the other parts of the magnet. Okay, safety. Well, there are a number of issues here. These things are loud, you know, over 100 decibels in them. That's bad for your hearing. Uh, there are missile effects. Uh, subject heating is more of an issue here now that we're going to higher fields. Um, in the way of safety, uh, the lab at, uh, in Colorado State used to put cushions around their magnets. I don't know if they still do or not. These were six inches or so of foam rubber with a nice colorful canvas cover on them. And I, I'm going to show a movie that will show you why or how those, that could be useful. And let's see this hand. Okay, so main field, I want to go over the subject heating before I show any, any entertainment. Uh, if we double B naught, the mouse eddy currents go up and the EMF goes up. So we quadruple power. 
with the same current in the coil here. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, quadruples the heating. I'm not sure that using the same RF current in the coil is going to do. Well, let's see, double. Oh, an interesting thing is it costs you four times the heat if you double the signal to noise ratio by increasing the field, or if you do it by using the same field and signal averaging four times. There's a, a unity there. But uh, using the same current at high field and low field that may not be the way to go because if you're limited in time the duration of your RF pulse is limited in time by the T2 star then you're actually going to have to get the job done faster at high field and so you may more than quadruple the energy deposited uh, if, if that's the case. Okay this thing uh, I had a couple of things I was going to say before the sound takes over uh, but <laughs> But I didn't give a cue for myself as to what they were. Uh, and here's another movie that you The explosion captured exclusively by John Wilder 47 News left the parking lot of PRMC in the surrounding area filled with tin and aluminum debris. A hospital spokesman says the blast caused no environmental damage and the mess will eventually be cleaned up. For some unknown reason at this point in time, the pressure inside the magnet built up and a surge of pressure was released from the center of the magnet causing this insulation to come out of the magnet and uh, over our parking lot and uh, luckily no one was injured and no property damage at this point. The unit was eight years old and was on its way back to the manufacturer which had planned to resell it. Now here's another look at what happened to it in slow motion. Okay, well, that, that's all I had to show. Um, if there are any comments uh, or questions. Uh, all right.